Hear it okay? All right, perfect. Oh, good. All right. All right. There we go. There's the mic. All right. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I, uh, I know many of you may have struggled with the traffic. I understand it's really awful out there. So I apologize to that for that. Um, uh, and so there may be a few people still trickling in here, uh, but we want we do want to get started. So thank you all for coming for, for our Arnson Grand Challenges lecture. Uh, this has become a, an annual tradition here. And um, welcome to the Biodesign Institute. For those of you who have not been here before, a lot of you who I see here, I know have been here many times before. Uh, but just to remind you, this is an institute created at Arizona State University for the purposes of solving world problems. And so we're here to talk about world problems and that's what we're going to do. But this, this particular, um, well, let me, let me start by having the sizzle reel and then I'll introduce Charlie. So why don't we go to the next slide and I have control of that. So let's see, there we go. Do I have to hit that again? Okay. Such as a biodesign provided critical science showing that key ingredients in antimicrobial soaps were causing damage to the environment and human health. We hope to create several biotech spin off companies to commercialize an innovative viral based therapy for the treatment of cancer. Our researchers are pioneering the novel use of naturally occurring microbes. 
fields to reduce contaminants such as metals and fertilizer in wastewater runoff from fields and coal plants. Thank you. So the sound I, I gather wasn't perfect for those folks online. And I, I want to first start by acknowledging that we have over 200 people online. So although this room, um, uh, we already have probably 40 or 50 people in here, but we have a lot more people online. So thanks to all of you for joining us from, from, uh, from the ethers. So um, uh, today's, today, today's lecture is a celebration of um, a career of someone who personifies the goals of Biodesign Institute, which is to come up with solutions for real world problems. Charlie Arnson um, started in, in, on a farm in Minnesota, uh, climbed the ladder to big pharma and blazed translational academic research um, uh, and led an extraordinary life in science. Uh, during his career, he and his collaborators have um, gained international recognition and helped put a special shine on ASU's star with dedicated efforts using plants as a biofactory for reducing life-saving vaccines and therapeutics. So Charlie joined ASU in 2000 and was the founding director of this institute. So he was the first person to really get this off the ground. And um, his, in, his research involved plant molecular biology, plant biotechnology and protein engineering, especially to help uh, in the developing world. Um, he served on the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology under George W. Bush, and was elected to the National Academies of Science in both the United States and India. One of his ideas uh, turned into um, a career crowning achievement basically um, using, uh, developing a, helping develop an experimental drug called ZMAP that was used to treat US aid workers in the help against Ebola in the 2014 epidemic. So he basically used plants to grow the proteins that were critical for developing that vaccine. Um, he was recognized in 2015 as the number one honoree with Fast Company's annual 100 Most Creative People in Business. Closer to home, he received the 2014 Arizona Bioscience React Researcher of the Year Award, uh, and given annual to the researcher who has made the most significant contribution to Arizona bioscience ad advancement. Um, he, uh, about four years ago today, Charlie retired from the Biodesign Institute, uh, concluding uh, uh, just a, an astonishing career. So that's Charlie right there. Raise your hand. <laughs> he, he's not going to hop up. He, he just had knee surgery, so we're not going to make him jump up and down, but we really want to thank you for everything you've done for us, Charlie, and uh, for establishing this lecture series. So let me tell you a little bit about today's speaker and, and, and partly why we're doing this. So this is um, Zach Rogers, and um, about, we, we started looking for a speaker in the area of supply chain about a year ago. So back in... And in Late January, early February of 2020 was when all of this COVID stuff started to get attention from everybody around. And that was around the time that a group of us here at the Institute thought, boy, we could really use some more testing in the state of Arizona. Okay, it was pretty clear that there was not going to be adequate testing. And so a small group of us met upstairs in a, in a small conference room. And one of the things that we knew from the beginning was that getting the materials to do the testing was gonna be key. And so among the seven people in the room, we assigned Joe Maselli the job of just making sure that we had all the supplies we need. We, we, we had a comp, we, I had a conference call with all the hospitals in the state at that time. And it was clear that amongst all of the hospitals combined, 
there were probably no more than a thousand nasopharyngeal swabs in the state. I mean, it was just astonishing. And there are 7 million people in the state of Arizona. So we clearly did not have enough swabs to do the testing we were gonna need. Some of the hospitals were already saying they were gonna keep half of what they had just for their own people. And so we started a, a, a process of just hunting down all of the stuff that we needed um, so we could actually run all the tests we needed to run. Making phone calls, in, in the end, we started manufacturing our own collection kits because it was just clear that it wasn't gonna be able to be purchased. And we were competing against all the other testers around the country at the time. Um, and then, then um, even then we realized that given the limited supply of swabs in the country and, and the need for people to actually stick those swabs in people's faces, that swabs were not gonna be the, the answer. And so we actually switched very quickly to saliva because at least people could collect their own samples and we could use drinking straws to collect it instead of fancy swabs. So it was pretty crazy. And, and throughout that whole process, we kept designing our testing to avoid all those supplies that everybody else was gonna go after. So we used a different chemistry, we used a different approach just to, to try to avoid that. And so that's why we thought supply chain would be a really critical talk to have here. And we were really lucky to find um, Zach Rogers, who is an assistant professor of operations and supply chain management at Colorado State University. But he's an ASU alum. So he did his PhD here at the WP Carey. <laughs> yep. Um, and of course, his he is the, he has, he's the son of a supply chain legacy. His son of distinguished ASU professor, Dale Rogers. Where's Dale? There's Dale. So, so the, the supply chain runs in that family. Um, his primary research goal is to demonstrate and explore the relationship between supply chain sustainability and financial performance. He's a leader in the, uh, for logistics managers index, conducting long-term research, exploring cradle to grave project management and identifying trends in the logistics industry which impact the global economy. Uh, Dr. Rogers' work has appeared in multiple academic journals, corporate white papers, trade publications, and conference proceedings. He's also a, a frequent speaker at both academic and practitioner-oriented conferences. And we're really thrilled to have him here. So let's give him a warm welcome. And I'm gonna let you take over the talk. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have one. Oh, here's, here's, I got a clicker. All right, well, well thank you. Um, Thank you everybody for having me. Thanks, Josh and, and Carrie and, and Jamie and, and Charlie, uh, especially. It's, it's such a cool honor uh, to be invited in, into your house and, uh, and to talk about, uh, about supply chain. You know, I, when I was a student here, I, I used that train station right there and I walked by the biodesign building, I don't know, 500 times and I never came in here. Uh, but I could see you had the cool video wall, you had videos about, oh, we're getting all the plastic out of the ocean and we're curing cancer. And I would always walk by and look at that and think, that looks a lot more fun than this inventory test I'm about to go do. I should go in there sometime. And I'm, and I'm in here for the first time and it's, it's not disappointing uh, at all. It's, it's, it's amazing to be here. So let's talk about COVID-19 and, and what it's done to supply chains. And, and really COVID in many ways has just pushed forward things that were going to happen already. Right? We saw this with e-commerce, we saw this with uh, returns policies, we saw this with, I think, nearshoring and onshoring, all these things that we we're going to do anyway, maybe five years down the road, 10 years down the road. Suddenly, we kind of had to figure out last year. And that's had a huge impact on supply chains, and, and, and I'm excited to, to talk about why. Um, to start, I, I just wanted to put up uh, the, the sort of mission of, of the Arneson Grand Challenge, and, and it's the Biodesign Institute seeks nature-inspired solutions to grand challenges in health, security, and sustainability for global impact. And uh, if you walk through the halls out here, you'll see all the cool stuff they're doing. They're, they're curing uh, Ebola with tobacco plants, and their little robots are going to go into our bodies and, and eliminate cancer, and, and they're going to get all the plastic out of the ocean. And, and in that proud tradition today, I'm going to talk about um, trucks. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but specifically, I'll talk about trucks and how they've been affected. The supply chain can get sick, too, and how the supply chain has been affected by by COVID. Um, and I, I think a, a really interesting, uh, a really interesting sort of data point when we think about how much more important supply chain has become. This was in the Wall Street Journal today. And so I apologize. I know I kept sending you guys a new version of my slides every 10 minutes. Uh, but this was the last one that I, that I finished today. And, uh, and it said a 412% increase in mentions 
in the term supply chain in third quarter earnings calls by Fortune 500 companies. So Q3 kind of just wrapped up 412, uh, 412% increase. And that comes after 123% increase uh, that, we, that we had in the second quarter. And so supply chains have gotten to be something that everybody knows about. And, and this is one great barometer. Here's the real barometer though, that, that will let you know how mainstream supply chain has gone. My grandma is 92 years old and she sends an email every single day. And generally the email is about things that the dogs did or something she found at Big Lots. That's, that's the, two, the two main categories. But lately she's been sending me stuff about supply chain. Hey, there's gonna be new factories in Indiana and Michigan and stuff like that. And so, you know, if it's, if Alice Rogers has supply chain on the mind that this has gone mainstream. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to get, get talking about it. So the obvious thing, the thing that I, I think we're, we're seeing most prevalently here is the lack of things on the shelves, right? I think that's when sort of people started realizing, hey, what's, what's going on? And, and for a lot of us, it probably started, remember that first two weeks of COVID when suddenly, uh, you know, toilet paper became our national currency? You remember that? And so, and, and suddenly that wasn't anywhere and you had to get up early at 7 a.m. to get into Target and stuff. And, and that's kind of continued for a while. And, and this picture actually is, is a picture I took of the Target by, by my house. And uh, this is where the soup would normally be. And you can see there's not a lot of soup here. There's only one. And let me zoom in and, and you'll understand why that's the only soup here. That's because that's the split pea and ham, which is gross. And the world can end, but we're still not eating that. And then this is another picture that, that I, I just saw the other day that I, I love. It's from Dunkin' Donuts. We apologize. But due to supply chain issues, we don't have donuts today. Then what do you have? <laughs> Your Dunkin' Donuts. And actually, it, it says right there, please try our wonderful bagels and muffins, which I assume is a joke um, that, that someone is making. And so supply chains have been affecting us all over the place. Uh, even affected me at my house this week. Uh, my wife ordered a Halloween costume in mid-September and said, hey, should I pay the extra 40 bucks to get it rushed here? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you should. It's a good idea. And it got to our house today which was after Halloween, actually. Uh, and she looked fine. But, uh, but so all this stuff happened. So we see, we can see all these pictures in front of us. But what are the underlying, what are the underlying issues? Well, there's the obvious causes that everyone can see. And, and this picture here uh, is a picture of the San Pedro Bay. So this is the, uh, the, the port right out, or the sort of the bay right outside the port of Los Angeles and, and the port of Long Beach. And in this picture, I think you can count 55 or so ships. Now, really, right now, there's 78 or 79. This picture actually was sent to me by, by my neighbor, uh, who's, who's a pilot. And I used to say his name, uh, but then he said, hey, you're, tell you're showing too many people this picture. I think I'm going to get a call from Southwest HR. So stop telling them that I'm taking a picture while I fly the plane. Uh, so, so he took this picture. And he took it because normally there should be, I don't know, one boat waiting there, maybe no boats waiting there. And now we have 50, 60, 70 boats. And on average, these boats, it's not like they're in line and they're going quickly. 13.4 days just sitting at anchor before they can even get close to the dock. So our stuff's just sitting there, not coming in. And so there's some obvious like, okay, we can see all those things. Now to the naked eye, it seems like, gosh, what, what's wrong with supply chains? These are totally failing. Why? Are we the most sophisticated economy in the history of the planet not able to have donuts at Dunkin' Donuts? That doesn't make any sense. Why is this happening? Well, it's because of this right here. This is the metric tons of waterborne imports coming into the United States. That red line there is 2021. The black line is 2020. You can see there was part of 2020 where we were a bit below average, but we actually caught up pretty quickly. By July, things were coming into the ports pretty fast. And you can see how that continued all the way through 2021. Look how much more stuff is coming into this country than normally does. And so we're actually not necessarily seeing, oh, supply chains are failing. I think in many ways, we're seeing sort of a heroic effort in, in the face of this unprecedented demand that we're dealing with right now. Partly we're dealing with this demand because we're trying to catch up from the hole we got in. Partly... Americans have a lot of money in their pockets right now. We've had stimulus. We can't go anywhere. We can't go on any trips. My parents got me from the airport yesterday and they said, oh, I haven't been in the airport in, in like a year. And normally my dad just has a room at the airport that he just you know lives in. He comes home sometimes. And so people aren't going on trips. They're not going places and they're spending all the money on, on goods and durable goods. Plus 
we have more service, uh, more of a service economy than we used to because of e-commerce. And, and I'm going to explain that using something called the Logistics Managers Index. So uh, like Josh mentioned a minute ago, I'm, I'm one of the, the authors of Logistics Managers Index. It's an index, a change index that we put out uh, every month. The, the new one just came out uh, this morning, actually, at, at 8 a.m. Eastern. So the numbers in here are brand new, and I know they were worried about it. They're like, gosh, when, when, is, the, when is the slides going to be done? I said, well, the report will be done that morning. So right after that, they'll be ready for you. Um, and, and what we do is we ask a bunch of sort of director level and above people who would sort of know this kind of thing. Hey, what's going on with inventory, warehousing, transportation? Is capacity up from last month? Is it down? Are prices up from last month? Are they down? We create a change index based on the purchasing managers index that's, that's over at, at ISM. They actually sort of helped us figure out how to do this. We can create a number and any number over 50 means we're seeing growth. Any number below 50 means we're seeing contraction. And just as a rule of thumb, if you hit a number like 70, that means we're in significant, significant expansion and significant growth. And so if we look, if we look at the last couple of years, you can see that we are kind of in the doldrums, right? We are growing very slowly from most of the end of 2019. And while the consumer economy was hot in 2019, industrial was slow. Remember, we were having a trade war and, and there was all this sort of slow industrial stuff going on. And there was actually trucking companies closing down because they didn't have enough business. The trucks were bored, had nothing else to do, which seems crazy now. And then we go forward. You can see where we hit COVID. We hit a 51 in April. Remember April 2020, how crazy that was? Everyone learned how to bake bread and we watched Tiger King and the Michael Jordan thing. And we we're like, oh, this will be a fun six, you know, fun six weeks. And now it's a year and a half later and we're all wearing masks. And so what happened is suddenly we started to see things come up. And for every month, every month almost for the last year, we've been over 70. So at this extreme rate of growth, the only two months where we were below 70 was January and December. And that was just because we had burned off so much inventory over the holidays that things went down. But uh, warehouse and transportation demand have stayed very, very elevated. And a way you can see this, I think, I think easily is in this picture right here. So that dotted black line is break even. So anything below that black line means contraction. Anything above means growth, okay? So this pink line here is aggregate capacity. So capacity in warehouses, capacity for inventory, capacity for transportation. It's been contracting every month since June. What that means is for the last, whatever that is, 18, 19 months, 18 months, there's less capacity than there was the month before. So in October, there's less than September, and there's less than August, and less than, than July. What that does, obviously, is it makes price go up like crazy. It's at 260, which is two full standard deviations above where the mean should be. So this is extreme, extreme levels of growth. And again, this isn't aggregate price. This isn't like, oh, it's going up and then mostly tailing off. Remember, everything over that black line means growth. So even if you see the green line dip a little bit, that just means the slope is going up at a slightly slower rate. So everything has been going up essentially since COVID started. And I think it's so interesting. You look back two years ago, it was at 184 uh, for capacity. So we we're slowly adding capacity. 175 for growth within sort of the normal error of, of the mean for growth. And then you come forward two years later and we have a 149 point swing. Uh, uh, on a scale of 300, okay, so, so 150 is a lot, 150 point swing in between the growth rates for capacity and, and, uh, and price. So things have really, really changed. So what are the impacts of all this here? So part of the reason that this is happening, part of the reason this is happening is because we bought a lot of stuff online in the last couple of years. Raise your hand if you bought more stuff online this year than maybe in the past. Oh, everybody, great. Except my dad, who was a pioneer with having shoes sent to our house every day in the early 90s. Um, so US e-commerce normally grows by 15% a year. And that's kind of what we plan for is 15% growth. Remember, supply chains are built to be as lean as possible. You don't want to have extra trucks or extra warehouses or ships because those are expensive. We want to be using those. So normally it goes 15%. Well, in 2020, is this going? In 2020? Hmm. Do I need to? Let's see. Well, it works here. Okay, there we go. In 2020, it grew by 45%. So we skipped forward three years in time in terms of the e-commerce we're doing. So what does that mean? That means we need three times the trucks 
for next mile delivery. That means we need three times the warehouses and not just any warehouse, but warehouses that are like close to your house, right? Think about where Amazon warehouses used to be. When I worked at an Amazon uh, 10 years ago, I was in like, maybe like maybe the fourth warehouse they ever built out in the middle of Nevada. It's McCarran, Nevada. Uh, it's between Reno and Fernley. I grew up in Reno. I'm okay now, but I grew up, I grew up in Reno. And, uh, and the only reason you go to McCarran, Nevada is because you work at Amazon or you're in the witness protection program. That is it. Those are the only two reasons you're there. It's out in the middle of nowhere and you only do it because you want to be cheap. Well, now there's Amazon warehouses in like Chandler and in the suburbs and they're trying to be as close to your house as possible. So not only do we need more of those, but the ones we need are really, really expensive. Okay. And they're hard to find. There's not just land in the middle of the city uh, like, like there is out in the middle of the desert. So it requires way more, way more uh, logistics capacity. And because of this, we've really had a revolution in the way that, that commerce works. And because of that, a revolution in, in what we need out of logistics. You know, in China, these, these by the way, are, are the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, internet sales days of the year. And you can see in China, they kind of carried on with a really concentrated focus on just specific days for e-commerce. You know, they, they got some of the things under control in a different way than we did. And, and for China, this, this, this blue day right here, that's their big, their big shopping day, it's Singles Day. Is anyone familiar with Singles Day? You know what that is? Singles Day is basically Prime Day for Alibaba. Uh, it's actually coming up. It's on, it's on November 11th. Does anybody know why it's on November 11th? It's because when you draw November 11th out, a 1-1-1, one, 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 it looks like the, the branches of a barren tree, which is what you are if you're single, so you should buy yourself something. That's, that's what they're saying. That's the message on Singles Day. It's rough. Uh, and then, you know, we can see the growth we had in, in Thanksgiving weekend, Cyber Monday, and also Prime Day. And we had some growth, but it wasn't, you know, cause, cause singles, they happened and everyone thought, oh, well, gosh, it's going to be crazy on Cyber Monday. And it really wasn't, it really wasn't. What we saw instead is that Black Friday didn't really happen last year. Instead, we had Black Fall. The whole thing, the whole thing was up by 30%. Essentially, instead of having one spike, we just had this big, long plateau. And that's really continued on through this year and looks like it's going to continue on through next year, too. You know, sometimes my students will ask, well, you know, is there a chance we'll overbuild the supply chain capacity? And, you know, if you look at supply chain, uh, if you look at e-commerce right now as a percent of retail, it's about 13% of total retail comes from e-commerce. In 2025, when the students who are freshmen now graduate, it'll be 26% of total retail. So it will double as a percentage. So one out of every four retail dollars is going to be e-commerce. And so this is a trend that's going to continue. So we're gonna to continue to need this additional, uh, additional capacity. The last piece of this, and, and we talked about it when, we, when I was uh, speaking with uh, the philanthropy board earlier, you're gonna get a much higher returns rate with e-commerce. So it's not just how do we get stuff to people, it's how do we get stuff back as well. It's a, you're three times more likely to return something that you buy online because you're like, well, this isn't blue or this isn't the right size. And so we had $110 billion of returns right after the holidays last year. Think about $110 billion of stuff just going backwards and the impact that's going to have on having enough trucks, having enough space. Okay. I, I think this is interesting. We break out the logistics index by upstream and downstream. And the, the orange bars here are downstream, that's retailers. Blue bars is, is upstream. So manufacturers, wholesalers, people like that. And this month, again, these numbers came out this morning. This, this month, we saw significant statistical differences in transportation capacity. So they're, both, they're contracting for both upstream and downstream firms, but 11 and a half points faster if you're downstream. So people trying to get goods onto shelves or to houses. There's essentially... To be at a 27 out of 100, that's a very, very low number. In fact, if we split that out, that'd be the lowest number we had in the history of this whole index is what we have right now for downstream, downstream companies trying to find trucks. Of course, that's reflected in price. Again, this scale goes to 100 and they're at a 95.5 for downstream. It could not be growing faster than it is now. And actually the, that number's been in the 90s for like the last six months. Finally, and I think this is interesting, it speaks to the problem we're having, we also had a big issue with inventory levels. 10.3 points higher for upstream firms and downstream firms. What that means is upstream, 
we are building up inventories. We are getting stuff in here quickly. We just can't get it to you. So it's in a warehouse somewhere. It's on a dock, probably on a chassis somewhere in Long Beach in Southern California, but it's not in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a problem because you're in Phoenix, Arizona, and you'd like to be where this stuff is. So there's a picture that I love. Uh, and I love it partly because I'm not in the market for a car right now. <laughs> this is, I don't know if anybody's seen this before. This is the, uh, the Kentucky Speedway. And it's full right now of, of F-150 trucks. The most profitable, the most profitable car in, in the country for the last 50 years. All these nice bodies are done, but there's no brains. There's no semiconductors to put in these things. And so each of these probably costs Ford, I don't know, thirty, forty thousand dollars, and they're just sitting there waiting, waiting for a brain. It's like the you know the scarecrow. It's a very similar situation uh, to the Wizard of Oz. And not only is this affecting these trucks, it's affecting the big Class Eight trucks, the fifty-three footers, eighteen wheelers that we need to deliver things. Because you might be thinking, okay, well we need more trucks. Let's build more trucks. Well, we actually have had record high orders for trucks for like the last year. And yet in July, the, the month we have most recent data for, we built fewer trucks in July than we have since the beginning of the pandemic. And it's not because the demand isn't there, it's because we don't have semi, semiconductors. Is there any guesses on how many semiconductors you need in a class eight truck? This will be on the test later. 15 to 35 for each truck. All right, it's like there's more capacity now in a truck hauling shoes down the road than there was in the, the Apollo rocket that went to the moon. <laughs> These things, I mean, and, you know, they look at everything. There's all this electronic logging devices. I, my, my wife's uncle's a truck driver. And if he looks down too many times, he gets a, an alert saying, Hey, are you texting while you're driving? And he'll be like, I was just looking at my shoe. And, and, and so there's so much memory, so much capacity in these things. And it's really, really difficult for us to build them quickly. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so the chips, yeah, it's a chip shortage essentially. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about what's going on then. because a lot of us can see, a lot of us can see the, the docks. Okay. Slow boats. Why isn't stuff getting here? Well, really there's a series of issues we're having first, many of the capacity or a lot of the capacity in Asia right now isn't online. So there's factories all over the place, you know, in parts of China, if one person gets COVID, they'll shut the whole thing down. They, sh they trapped 30,000 people in Shanghai Disney earlier this week because one person had COVID. That was probably no longer the happiest place on earth. That seems tough. That seems like a tough deal in there. And so they're shutting down factories in Vietnam and China all over the place. Then, of course, we have the bottleneck at the ports, which we talked about already. Boats can't get in. But why can't the boats get in? Because, you know, we've gone to 24-7 operations at the ports. It seems like something should be happening. Well, it's because there's a lot of bottlenecks after this. We don't have enough containers. You know, shipping containers, last year at this time to, to bring a shipping container from China to the West Coast of the US was $3,000 a container, which seemed very high at the time because normally it's around 1,500. Today it's 18,000. So it's 18,000 just for the box to go across the water. Now, keep in mind, $50,000 is about the value that's normally in the container. And 40% of it now is just the value of the box going across the water. So it's very hard to get shipping containers. And one of the reasons it's hard to get shipping containers is because a lot of them are stuck on the chassis that we use to move containers across, across the docks. And one of the reasons we can't get any chassis, why that's a bottleneck, is because we don't have any warehouse space. We don't have any capacity to unload the containers or to put stuff. There's a ton of containers just sitting on chassis right now that have been there for 15 days. And they're there because we, they, we don't have anywhere to put the stuff. And we don't have anywhere to put, we don't have any space in the warehouses because we can't move the stuff out of the warehouses because we don't have enough train cars. And like we mentioned a minute ago, we don't have enough trucks. And so when someone goes on TV and, and look, the, the Biden administration is trying to figure it out and, um, you know, oh, uh, oh, the government doesn't understand supply chain. Oh, oh no, the first time that's ever happened. I mean, you know, they're, they're trying their best. But, you know, so they did this. We'll smash, we'll smash the bottleneck at the ports. What did that do? just ran a bunch of stuff into the containers and the chassis didn't really move anything. And so opening up the ports for 24 hours a day, that's like, oh, I'm gonna run through this red light. Oh, now there's five more red lights. It's not actually that helpful. It's not that helpful to do. 
I spent more time than I'm proud of, by the way, looking for a sound effect for the hammer earlier. <laughs> All right. So, so even if we get through the one bottleneck, we have all these other bottlenecks we have to deal with. And what is it doing? What is it doing? This is the last, I think, capacity price slide I'll, I'll show you here. Again, the black line is, is break even. The green line is available transportation capacity. Gray is warehouse capacity. And you can see, you can see that transportation capacity and warehouse capacity have been declining essentially since the beginning, uh, essentially since the beginning of, of the pandemic. There was one month where warehouse capacity grew, and it was a 50.5. So it was like the bare minimum of, of could I be growing. But other than that, they've been contracted. Well, what does that do? Well, you see these orange line and this blue line. So that's the blue line is inventory levels. How fast are we adding inventory? The orange line is inventory price, inventory cost. And usually these numbers, these lines track pretty close together. If you look a year ago, they're only four points apart, uh, a 69 and a, a 73 pretty close together. If you look today, 24 port points apart. That's the only, this has never happened before in our index. Why is it happening? Well, essentially what this shows us is kind of what we saw with, you know, the, the tons coming in through the ports. Inventory is in the system. It's just moving very, very quickly at a high volume. Okay. Now, not as much as we would like to be moving, but a lot is moving through. And so even though inventory levels are staying low, inventory costs have been very, very elevated because we don't have anywhere to put it and things are moving faster, are moving faster than we can possibly handle. Okay. So I didn't just come here. This, is, this isn't just called the, the Arnson Grand Tell Us All Your Problems series. This is the Grand Challenge series. So, so what, can we, what can we possibly do to deal with this? Well, first, we have to change how we do supply chains. We have to prioritize flexibility over efficiency. Remember the, the example we said with Amazon? How oh, it used to be just oh, as efficient as you can, put a warehouse in the middle of the desert, as much stuff on the truck as possible, drive it far, do things cheaply. We changed that for downstream consumers. We're going to have to change that upstream as well uh, uh, for industrial production. So we're going to have to use a portfolio approach. Does anybody in here you know, like, like to, to play in the stock market? Does anybody do that in here? Probably. I, I assume some people do. So, so you raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you for volunteering. Do, do you just buy one, one kind of stock, just one industry? You don't just like, oh, I'm all retail. No, what do you do? Diversify. Diversify. You have a portfolio. Well, that's a great idea that everybody else except supply chains know. And so we're going to have to have a portfolio approach to supply chains. We also need the infrastructure we need to accommodate the post-COVID consumers. So consumers now imagine, hey, yeah, one out of every $4 I spend, that can be online. I can return anything I want. We need to have the infrastructure to support that. We'll do that partly through building more capacity, partly through diversifying not only the manufacturers, but also the inbound routes. You know, right now we have essentially everything moving through Southern California. And it turns out people don't just live in Southern California and that's not incredibly efficient. Finally, we have to get creative. So, Let's talk about diversification. So one issue we're having is there's too much focus on a single path. This is a picture I took on a website called, called Marine Traffic. I took it last night. It's a fun website, by the way, if you want to see like where people are fishing or the, the pink ones, by the way, are pleasure boats. And so you can, you can, which is yachts. So you can scroll over them and see all the dumb things that people name their boats. That's pretty fun to look at the pink ones. And uh, especially if you do like this little Irvine Long Beach right there, there's some real goofy ones there. And, uh, but so we have all these boats just, just, smashed in to the San Pedro Bay. Okay. And that's partly because these are really the only ports that can handle any, any kinds of, uh, of cargo. You know, Savannah is, oh, they're going to expand. That's great. But one, it's, it's Savannah, so it's not that close to anything. Plus, they're going to expand by 1.5 million TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units next year. Long Beach is going to do 10 or 12 million just by themselves. So one and a half million is, is good, but that doesn't make a huge difference. And so we have all this capacity right there. What that does is not only does it jam up the ports, it makes trucks very, very imbalanced. This picture here is uh, the cost of driving between Dallas and Los Angeles, okay? The blue line is the cost to drive from, from Los Angeles to Dallas. The green line is the cost to drive back the other way, Dallas to Los Angeles. 
And you can see over the last, you know, they used to be pretty close. And you can see over the last couple of years, now per mile is $3.62 to drive from Los Angeles to Dallas. And it's only $1.29 to drive from Dallas to Los Angeles. Now I'm not a geography expert, but I'm pretty sure it's the same distance either way, whether you go from Dallas to LA or LA to Dallas. The difference is the demand coming out of these things. And so we have all these trucks that we can't even use because they're out of position because we just keep bringing stuff out of California. We're not bringing that much back. For every three packages FedEx brings out of California, they only bring one back in. Okay, and so we have all these trucks that are racing back to California to move stuff for us, but they're racing there empty and not really doing us much good. And so we have a really inefficient use of resources because we're overly dependent on just getting everything in through this one port. Finally, we go inland further. And you know, if you're going on rail from the West Coast to the East Coast, you're probably going to go through Chicago. There's a very good chance. <coughs> Last month, there was a 20-mile traffic jam of trains in Chicago. Think about how annoying rural was uh, for most of you on the way here. Now multiply that by, because that was probably, what, half a mile of congestion? So multiply that by 40, and then also it's trains. And think about how, how fun that would be. And so we basically have this one critical path that we're using for everything. And we need to diversify. We need to have more of a portfolio approach. So what do we need to do? The first thing we need to do is protect the key parts of the supply chain. You know, something I, I talked to Carrie about, I talked to Josh about it, it. When we were sort of ramping up the COVID stuff, suddenly it was, well, we don't really have everything we need. We don't have pipettes. Someone mentioned in, in the philanthropy meeting, we don't have enough antibiotics. Right, all the there's no antibiotics really that are made in the United States anymore. Right, two two places placed in China, one in India, I think, was what we said. And so we have all these key things. And the White House actually put out a report in June that said, "Hey, semiconductors, microprocessors, antibiotics, or it really any pharmaceutical components, high capacity batteries, um, and also you know sort of rare earth metals and minerals, which I don't know how we're gonna do that one." Uh, those are because, you know, those are in the ground. Uh, um, those need to come back to the United States. We actually do have one great storage, of, uh, one great potential mine for rare earth metals of, of, uh, in the United States. You guys know where that is? It's under Yosemite. So we're not getting that anytime soon. Uh, so we got to get it from Africa, China, a place like that. But we can have things like this here. And this is a, a picture from, uh, I think, last month. Intel breaks ground a $20 billion plant to do U.S. chips. This is in Chandler. TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, ma semiconductor manufacturing company in the world. This is their, their, uh, their plant in North Phoenix. And so we have to bring key goods back to the United States. We can't bring everything back to the United States. You know, there was an op-ed in the New York Times the other day um, by a, a senator from Missouri and he said, well, we should, we should require, uh, you know, 25% of everything to just be made in the United States. Well, no matter how much you want it to be 1950, it's not going to be 1950 again. Uh, but we can bring certain things back, key things back, like semiconductors, like pharmaceutical equipment. And it's going to be, it's going to be great for Arizona. You know, there's more semiconductors than things than we've ever had. We just said there's 35 in every truck. I bet the average person in here, if you have a a smartwatch and a phone and a laptop in your backpack, you might be walking around with 10 or 15 semiconductors on you right now. And yet, we only made 12% of the semiconductors in 2021. That's down from 37% in 1990. So as they become more and more important, we've outsourced more and more. So we need to bring back the key things. But like I said, we can't bring back everything. So we have to diversify everything else. Just like the move that we talked about with the Amazon warehouses, we need to have a portfolio approach to sort of the non-critical goods, but the things that we really need. A lot of companies have moved to the China plus one policy, and people were doing this already. We already saw a lot of movement into to Central America and Vietnam and places like that, but COVID has really, really sped it up. Okay, it's moving a lot faster. And one of the ways that we can diversify is Pan American manufacturing. And there's a great article uh, on this, written by uh, partly by one of the members of the audience and of my family, uh, in the Harvard Business Review in June, the case for, for Pan American manufacturing. And we can make things in Mexico and El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala. Actually, Nike is already doing this. 
this is a uh, um you know kyler murray's jersey and all the nike jerseys now are being made in in honduras they're making them there already and so we can move certain things here not only by the way not only by the way is that good for us because we can have a steadier stream of things coming in because you know for anyone who's uh who uh hasn't brushed up in geography lately mexico is is significantly closer than china uh we can get there pretty quick we'd be there tonight if we need to um we can get things here faster, but also it'll improve the economies of those places. If you look at the average age in Central America, it's pretty young. It's a pretty young place with not a lot of economic opportunity. And so if you can improve those places, I mean, this is about how do we make the world a better place? This will make the world a better place. Investing our supply chains, diversifying them for American consumers, but also for Central and Pan-American workers. That's, it's a win-win, really. And plus, on the sort of social capital side of this, it will really do a lot to help with immigration issues at the border. If the, if the economies in Central America are good, because, you know, it's not like a fun thing to be like, hey, should we walk across Mexico? Should we take a bunch of kids, walk a thousand miles across there? That's not something you would do if you had any good economic opportunities. But if we do something like this, we can not only help supply chains here, make things more resilient, but we can help all those people that feel like that's their best choice. All right. Finally, multiple points of entry, like we talked about using a lot of boats or using a lot of different ports. And then finally, it is an interesting pilot program and, and we'll see if this works or not. There's been a lot of talk for years and years about inland ports. Hey, let's have an inland port. And Salt Lake City is now, uh, there's a trial with the, the, the Port Authority of Salt Lake City, which is hilarious that there's a Port Authority of Salt Lake City uh, and, uh, and the Port of Long Beach. And they're going to be taking intermodal, so train, cargo straight off the boat straight to salt lake city for so for goods they're going to be in the inner mountain region so salt lake city uh you know utah arizona new mexico colorado maybe we'll bring things straight over there and maybe that'll expedite the process just by getting all those containers off the dock freeing up some space freeing up some capacity and so not only do we have to diversify where we get things from we have to diversify how we then spread them out all over the country and have a more flexible reliable system Okay. The other thing we need to do is shrink distribution networks. We've talked a little bit about this already, but we can't just have all these warehouses out in the middle of nowhere. This is a Macy's in Colorado, uh, right outside of Denver. And it, it's still kind of a Macy's, but not really. You can't actually, it's a Macy's, but you can't go in and go shopping in there. And some of you are probably thinking, well, I don't go into Macy's anyway, whatever. <laughs> but, but they changed it. So now instead of it being a store, it's a distribution center. So think, think about how Macy's is laid out. A lot of space, a lot of light, things like that. You can get the Kanye shoes, you see where they are. Well, now it's, everything's just packed on top of each other in racks and racks, and it's a much more efficient use of this. Plus, now they can deliver it to your house. We have people trying to do the pickup stuff, the mix modes, the omni-channel. We have multi-story warehouses. This is a real warehouse, by the way, in downtown Seattle. And you can see it's like a three-story warehouse. When I was working in warehouses, they're all flat and giant. And now, if you go in like a new Amazon warehouse, it'll be five stories, still in the same space, but five stories. And there's elevators. Well, so, so here's what's funny about Amazon warehouses. Most of the people there who work in the warehouse take the stairs. The elevators are generally for the robots. Uh, and they can go up and down. And it's kind of fun. I don't know what the small talk is like in the robot elevators, but they're going up and down all over the place. And then you got stuff like this, robotic delivery in Beijing. I saw some of these, by the way, walking around the Tempe campus. Every time I come back here, by the way, it's like time moves five years faster than it does everywhere else on the planet. And people are on all the zippy little scooters and there's robots all over the place. And, and I like it. So we also have, I think, some more sort of sci-fi ones that have been patented, but not actually in use yet. This is uh, Amazon has a patent for a blimp warehouse. So this is a blimp that will float over the, over the city and drones will come down and deliver things to your house. And I, how could that go wrong? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Blimps historically safe and, uh, and I'm sure we're not, you know. On truck 3D printing, that's another, another patent they have. Oh, we'll just make it on the way to your house. What do you want? Let's drive around. If it, if it takes longer, we'll do a lap <laughs> and we'll have it ready to go. This one is actually real, by the way. This is in, in San Francisco. It's similar to the 3D printing in the truck, but it's for pizza. And so you can order a pizza and the whole thing is just a truck and they just drive around and cook the pizzas on the way to your house. And that sounds like a good idea if you live in Phoenix. Phoenix has great roads, right? Big, flat roads, straight. You know what the roads look like in San Francisco? They look like this. 
<laughs> There's no way that's going to go well. There's another one that Amazon has, the Amazon Thrower. This, I think now they're just, jo they're just joking around. I don't even know what this is supposed to do, but somehow they'll throw something and another one will catch it and it's big metal arm. And then the final one that Amazon has is an underwater fulfillment center. Essentially, we're building some sort of infrastructure for the Terminator robots. This is what Amazon is doing. I don't even know how that one's worked. They, I, I assume there's one in the middle of a volcano that's in the works now uh, that, that we'll see soon. So clearly, we're going to change what we do. And, and all of these, though, all of these, all of these are made with the goal not to create a 1984 situation, but made with the goal to get us things faster. Okay. So... Let's talk about, is there a way out of this, okay? So not only do we ask what's going on now, we say, okay, in the future, where do we think we're gonna be when we do our, our logistics index? And both future transportation at 55.7 and future warehousing capacity at 60.2 were positive this month for the first time in, in quite a while. Okay, so we've been asking people, and, and usually, by the way, our, our respondent base is pretty good. They're about 90% accurate um, in terms of what's going to happen in 12 months actually happens. And so both of those capacity metrics are, are pretty positive. Hey, we are, you know, we might have sort of hit the bottom of this, and now we're, we're back on the way up. So we're building more capacity. The issue is, you can see that all of our price metrics are still in the mid-80s. Now, they were in the high 80s and 90s for the last couple months. So the fact they're down in the mid 80s, that's, that's some progress. But essentially, what this is saying is like, look, we're working on it. We're building capacity, but it's going to be expensive for a while. It's going to be a while before we're really out of this. Most estimates now say 2023 will probably be back to normal, whatever normal is going to be. It's, it's going to be a little while. And so there's light. There's light at the end of the tunnel. It's a long tunnel, though. It's going to be a while for us, for us to get through. Now, this disruption that happened, it's not the first one we've had. There's been disruption events. This is just the last 20 years of disruption events. A lot of you remember these. Remember SARS, the big recession, Hurricane Sandy, all these different things that have happened. One of them, uh, one of them that's not on there, by the way, that I would like to add is this one. You guys remember when that boat tried to Tokyo drift through the uh, Panama Canal last year? This, by the way, this boat, the Evergreen, 25,000 TEUs, okay? So 25,000 20 foot uh, equivalent containers. That's essentially the equivalent of between eight and 9,000 trucks on top of one boat. Because, you know, a lot of people, I think you see the boats, you don't realize the cargo goes all the way down to the bottom. These are really giant stacks. There's a lot, it's like an iceberg. There's a lot you can't see. So 8,000 trucks, a boat the size of 8,000 trucks. And it's going through a canal that when the British built it, they had to get permission from the Ottoman Empire. How long has it been since anybody thought a lot about the Ottoman Empire? A while? And so that's one of the issues is we're doing all this with this old infrastructure. And this speaks to, hey, you know, for, for supply chains, good has been the enemy of great. We've been able to get through. And so we've been dealing with sort of suboptimal, suboptimal uh, routes and capacity for a long time. And COVID is really the wake-up call that we need. You know, with COVID, with COVID, it's not just a virus to immune systems. I mean, it is. But in many ways, it acts like a virus to supply chains. If you think about what a virus does, it really hurts you in the short run, right? A virus is terrible in the short run. It might even, might even do more than hurt you. But if you survive it, you come out on the other side strong. Your immune system is ready for the next time one of these comes up. And like we just saw from that chart, another one of these is going to come up. But what this does is it's made supply chain stronger and more efficient. And we're going to come out on the other side of this in a much better position. Like I said, what COVID did is it just moved us down the road. We were already going towards a bigger portfolio approach, towards more distribution, towards all this stuff. But what this did is it just, it just kicked you off the cliff and go where we need to go. Are there, are there some students in here today? Looked like there's some students in here today. You guys started your final papers yet? No, of course you haven't. You still have three weeks of school left. 
But isn't there going to be a great, mo about two weeks where you're like, oh, that's really due. That's going to be great motivation. You're actually going to get something done, aren't you? Supply chains are the same way. We needed the push. We needed the push to get ready, but, but they will be. And, you know, the state of Arizona, by the way, is going to be one of the biggest benefactors to this. With the, the chip manufacturing that's going to be here, with being so close to Central America, where I think a lot of manufacturing is going to come from, Arizona is actually in a great sort of privileged geographical spot. Where, where things are really, I think this change is really gonna be beneficial and positive. So we're gonna improve not only supply chains, but I think the environmental sustainability of supply chains by shrinking the supply chain, the social uh, sustainability of supply chains by including more people in them, by making them more efficient, by getting goods to people quicker, including goods like medicines, and the things that you're doing here with these new apparatuses, we're going to be able to get those people quicker and we're able to do things quicker, have more efficient research and, and more efficient drug distribution and, and overall global health. So yes, we're going through a very hard time right now. And it's frustrating when we can't have donuts and Halloween costumes because those are both very fun, but we're going to come out on the other side, stronger and more efficient for the growing pains we're going through now. So that is the end of, of, of my talk. So if there's any, questions or anything from the audience and and new lmi reports go up the first tuesday of every month so at, at this website right here uh yeah go ahead the kid who needs to start his term paper testing hey um could you come teach at asu <laughs> We really need you. I mean, if, if you guys can afford me, I'd be happy to come back. <laughs> there we go. So no, I, actually, I, I actually know what the professor at ASU make. They, they can definitely afford me, actually. Yeah, no, I, 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 this is where I went to school. This is where I grew up. And, and hopefully no one from CSU is on the live stream. But yeah, sure, I'd come back. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Nivi Biani. I'm a PhD student in um, waste management. Mm. So I wanted to ask you, how is can we think about this in the back end merging it with supply chain so instead of the trucks going back empty um taking the waste and sort of thinking about waste differently aka not a waste a resource um in terms of the semiconductors issue that you brought up my i'm biased my research on landfill mining and i know we have a lot of metals in landfill yeah um you talked about localizing and shortening the supply chain is there what like when we talk about supply chain for me it's almost synonymous with waste management when you have consumption you have waste mm -hmm. and there's just got to be ways to innovate in the circular economy space and the waste space yeah. right now than ever before is there anything you have to say about that because you didn't touch upon that and you're so fantastic Fantastic presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. It told me I only had 35 minutes. So I took that as 45. But uh, but I so you know, one of the main things that I, I research actually is reverse logistics. So returns and things like that. And if you look at something called the secondary market, okay. So the secondary market is goods that were either overstocked or returned or something happened. Okay. They, and, and they're going back through maybe a salvage dealer, an auction. You know, sometimes out here at the grocery stores in Mesa, they'll just have pallets. You can go bid on them and stuff. And it'll be like lunch boxes from the third Hunger Games movie that, you know, who knows who wants those anymore, but you can go bid on them, sell them on eBay, dollar stores, whatever. If you look at that, it's, 68, it's $682 billion last year is the value of the goods that went through the secondary market. That's 3.1% of US GDP. Going through, going through there. That's more than we spend on Department of Education, Department of Transportation, Department of Defense, shoes, gas combined. So it's more than we spend on any of that stuff. And so supply chains are already doing a lot. I mean, in many ways, supply chains are the drain for any, because any system, right? You need to have a drain in the system. And so supply chains act as the drain to get rid of a lot of different things. Now, uh, uh, a legitimate question could be, gosh, aren't we generating a ton of waste, all this e-commerce and all this stuff? And yes, absolutely we are. Um, and part of that is exacerbated. And it's one of the reasons why we can't just have trucks full of waste going back the other way. China won't take our cardboard anymore. They won't take our plastic. That used to be how we got rid of it. The richest woman in China used to be the lady who recycled all the cardboard. Well, China has decided, you know what? Because uh, our number one export for years going back to China was trash, essentially. And they thought, could you send us something better? <laughs> could we change this up? And so they don't take any of our recycling anymore. They used to take about 90, 95% of it. And so in many ways, and this is partly, by the way, because of the trade war that happened, they stopped taking back cardboard and plastic and stuff. 
which that by the way, the trade war was not a, not a smashing success. Cause you know what? You want to know one of the things we put a, a, a tariff on, which is funny semiconductors. Yeah. How's that going now? <laughs> so, so they, they can't take back everything, but there are certainly systems that the supply chain can provide that get rid of some waste. As far as going to a totally wasteless world, um, you know, there's certainly things like packaging reduction. I mean, Walmart's supplier packaging reduction program has been one of the most successful sustainability initiatives in the history of the world. Uh, I don't know if Kevin Dooley is in here, but, uh, but he helped them kind of come up with that. And, you know, it's funny because when, when Walmart did it, their stock price went down. People thought, Walmart, what are you doing? You don't care about the environment. You care about money. You guys got to stay in your lane. But actually, they save hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel every year. Because when the boxes are smaller, you know what you can do? Put more in a truck. And so there is certainly, if we're going to have sustainability, it has to happen in the supply chain. Um, but in terms of no waste, you know, I don't know, maybe we could 3D print everything on the way to your house and, and that'll get rid of the boxes. Thank you. We're going to take one from the audience online. Oh. So one of our questions from Ian online is that much fanfare has been made about applying machine learning and automation to supply chains. How do you see these and other tech modernizing supply chain decision-making and resource allocation? And what's mm -hmm. the main resistance to tech adoption in the supply chain world? So the main resistance, I'll start with that first, Ian. Thanks for the question. The main resistance is everybody's really busy right now. And sometimes it becomes difficult to bring in a new system or a new initiative when you're so busy with the day-to-day -day stuff, it can become difficult. That being said, uh, we, we have done some research with, with big data supply chains, and we do see an increasing adoption of um, cognitive analytics and AI and systems like that. And, and really where they're being used mostly now is on the forecasting and predicting side. So how much do we need to build? What is demand going to look like? Uh, how do we arrange our suppliers? There's a lot of AI use for routing. How do we do trucks really efficiently and things like that? Um, at the end of the day, though, what you have to remember is that 50% of US GDP is small businesses. And for trucks, 90% of all truck fleets have 20 trucks or less. So most of these really, so much of the economy, you know, we, we, today we talked about Amazon and Apple and all these big companies, but most of the economy is actually small companies where they're probably still doing everything on Excel. And so part of it is, part of it is we have a lot of small companies doing things. And then also it just takes some time. It takes some time to get to, to the level of adoption uh, that we need to. But, but I think if you looked at supply chains, you would see that especially a company like, like Amazon, like JB Hunt, like the leaders in, in supply chain are moving really, really quickly. Uh, and more quickly, I think, than maybe you would in other industries. Any more questions in here or any more online? Yeah. Sure. My plane's not delayed 30 tomorrow morning, so I'm whatever. <laughs> From Natalie online, what is the role or balance of reducing costs in manufacturing versus improving transportation systems? It seems very challenging to develop something like a natural glove or N95 mask that is cost competitive with foreign partners such as China or Malaysia. It is. It, it, you're right. It is challenging. Um, and, and, but, but I think that we're going to move to a system where we have to prioritize service more than we have over, over, uh, over just cost. You know, when they built the Rams Stadium, this, this by the way, just to give you an idea of, of how, how much we focus on costs versus service and delivery time. When they built the, the new stadium where the Rams play in, in Los Angeles, they had to get uh, granite. Now there's a big granite mine in Palmdale, California. It's about 45 miles away from where they built that stadium. Do you know where they source granite from though? Victoria, Canada, <laughs> north of Vancouver. And the reason for that is because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to send a bunch of granite, one ton of granite. It's cheaper to have it go a thousand miles down the coast on a boat and then 20 miles on a truck than it is for it to go 45 miles on the truck the other way. Think about what that means. And now apply that to everything that we manufacture. And those are the types of decisions that companies have been making. Hey, let's just get it from Canada because we'll save you know, $300 per ton and we're using a whole bunch of these, so great. And so 
those are sort of the, the balance, Natalie, that, that we're working on right now is how do we, because we need to have low cost, you know, because I, I asked my, my students this, we'll have a quiz. Hey, should we make more stuff in the U.S.? Yeah, we should. Should we, should we, you know, pay workers more? Yeah, no, we absolutely should. Okay. If everything on Amazon was 25% more, would you, would you still shop there? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> and they say, and it's funny, they say, well, I'm in college now, but maybe later when I have more money. And I think you're never going to have more money. Do you know what your student debt is? And so they don't know. They don't really know. Um, but, but I, I think we have to figure out that balance. And, and that's one of the main challenges that, uh, that, that we were talking about today. Am I allowed to do one more? Yeah. Question? Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm not even an amateur um, supply chain expert or economist by any means, but a lot of the things that you said, I think, apply even more strongly to climate change and climate change's impact on the supply chain. So if you mm -hmm. have any, I'd be eager to get your thoughts on that in any form yeah. that you may have. Absolutely. Well, the, the system of, of shipping everything around the world, there is some, some issues there. Um, now, what's funny about it is if you look at the economies of scale, it actually is not that bad for the economy to ship things across the ocean. Boats are, are pretty efficient, especially now that you do something called slow steaming, where you kind of, and this is something that's pioneered during the recession, where you, you start the boat going across the water, and then you kind of take your foot off the gas and you let the water sort of float you across. And it's maybe 20% slower, but you, you save 40% of the fuel. And so you cut out emissions, emissions pretty drastically. Also, I would say, you know, when you look at an Amazon truck driving around the road, let's, let's say Walmart, okay? So let's say 10 of us are going to go to Walmart and we're going to get something at Walmart. You know, whatever it is, whatever it is they sell at Walmart, you know, some cheap socks, some groceries, a rifle, all the stuff they have uh, at Walmart. And so all 10 of us are going to go, we're going to get something. So if we drive to Walmart and then drive back to our house, that's 20 car trips, basically. If we order it on walmart.com and it comes out of the back of the Walmart store, and, and mostly now if you order from Target or Walmart, a lot of it just comes out of the back of the store. Then that's just one van going to 10 different houses, which actually is less driving around and is less emissions in the air than you're going to have otherwise. And we're moving towards electric trucks and self-driving trucks and a lot of things. And, and I, I do think that supply chains really, like I mentioned with the Walmart thing, because supply chains are always about, well, what's the best thing for business? Well, it turns out that being sustainable is about the best thing for business that you can do, right? Reusing resources. You know, Apple, you mentioned the, the electronics waste. Apple takes cell phones back. That's good. That's green. You know the real reason they do that? You know how much gold is in an iPhone? Last year, Apple pulled over 2,000 pounds of gold out of phones. You know how much gold goes for? What is it, $1,900 an ounce? <laughs> it's fit, they pulled $50 million of gold just out of old phones. And so being green can also be very, very profitable and very sustainable. And a lot of times those are pioneered. Those programs are pioneered, like with Walmart sustainability program, like with Apple recycling program, through supply chain initiatives for both forward and reverse logistics. Sure. You let me go for like 10 minutes. Now you're going to clarify? <laughs> that was fine. Let's say Savannah expands their capacity and gets hit by an extreme hurricane and that port is done for 10 years. So It, it won't be done for 10 years. Okay. No, when, when we had the tsunami in Japan, there's two people in the back row actually who I wrote a paper with about the tsunami in Japan. How are you guys doing? Good? All right. Good to see you. Um, you know, they recovered, what was it, Robert? They recovered in what, three months? Four months? Yeah. And that was a, a once in 200 year tsunami. So, so part of what I'm saying here is that, okay, even if there was a hurricane that really took Savannah down for six months, that's why we have to diversify. That's why we have to have a portfolio approach. That's why we can't just use Savannah. We have to use New York, New Jersey. We have to use ports in North Carolina. We have to use the Gulf. We have to have inland ports. And so that's, that's part of what you're saying is, is also what I'm saying, I think. It's not just viral outbreaks and disruptions we're going to have. There's also natural ones. And by the way, the natural ones are better because you at least know they're going to happen. We know there's going to be a hurricane in Florida, right? We know that's going to happen. We know it's going to be really snowy in the mountains going from here to Colorado at some point. So we can kind of plan for that and we can make supply chains resilient and able to, to deal with those partly by using a portfolio model and diversifying what we're doing. Well, that was a phenomenal talk. Thank you. Let's thank, thank um, you very much. Zach Rogers.
Okay, so I'd, I'd like to, um, or we have a couple Oh more. yeah, so I had some backup slides. Um, by the way, I, I got here this morning at 7.30 to teach a class, because uh, the supply chain faculty heard I was coming back, and they're like, oh good, we're, and uh, you know, why don't you teach two classes? So I taught two classes this morning. One at 7.30, but, and, and no other university on the planet, by the way, has 7.30 a.m. classes, just Arizona State. <laughs> And, uh, and I had a meetings all day and a totally packed schedule. And, uh, and, you know, when you come back home to Arizona state, they put you back to work and, uh, and it felt good <laughs> and it felt very familiar, uh, to be back. And, and especially up here, given a high pressure talk and a tie in front of half my dissertation committee, there was some PTSD earlier in the night. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was nice to be here. Okay. So I, I we have one last little event. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once more, one more round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Munkel, who is the Director of Development for the ASU Foundation. So, Elizabeth. Thank you. Good evening. As Josh mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Munkel, and I have the great pleasure of working with the Biodesign Institute on behalf of the ASU Foundation. Events like tonight's Arts and Grand Challenges lecture are made possible through philanthropy. I'd like to thank again, uh, Dark. Dr. and Mrs. Arntzen for their visionary investment in this lecture many years ago. So thank you. Philanthropic support drives so much that happens at Biodesign, and we would love for you to join us in making this work possible. One way to accomplish this is to join our Pioneer Circle. The Pioneer Circle is comprised of science enthusiasts, curious knowledge seekers, and committed philanthropic supporters who invest in Biodesign's groundbreaking research. Several members of the Pioneer Circle are here tonight, and thank you for your support of Biodesign. You too can join the Pioneer Circle with a gift of $1,000 or more each year. Philanthropy plays a unique and vital role in our work by allowing our researchers to explore new and untested frontiers of disease detection, drug therapy, and sustainable materials. To learn more or to join, please contact me, or if you're online, I believe the website was just drop, dropped in the chat box. So thank you so much. Okay, well, I, that really wraps us up. I wanna thank um, uh, Dr. Rogers again. I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, I, there may be still some cookies out there, I think, so go have a cookie um, and, um, and maybe chat a little bit, even though <laughs> we're still in COVID times. But once again, thanks, everybody. Have a great night.